Amen. Today, we are starting a brand new series, a message series, except this is a series that's not a series. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, T-Mobile is the uncarrier. This is the un-series. It is, uh, it is uh, several messages in a row that don't necessarily have the same topic or theme like we often do. And so, starting today, our, our, our four pastors will each bring a message that is just something that, uh, based on something that the Lord has spoken to our hearts recently. So we're just seeking the Lord individually, not necessarily trying to fit within a theme or a topic uh, like, like we often do. And I am really excited about it. So I really encourage you to, to be a part of every one of these services today and then, and then the, the next three after this for this unseries of four <laughs> messages. I think it's going to be good. Now today, we are going to be looking at something that is very important to Jesus' heart. And it, you'll find it in John chapter 15. Verses 1 to 13. So if you have a Bible, why don't you turn there? If you have a smartphone, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can always get the U version app, great Bible app, and dial it up so you have the Word of God in your hands. But why would I say this is something that is very important to Jesus? Well, there, there are several, um, several clues about the timing of what, he, of what he brought and how he brought it. So in this part of the book of John, so this is a book written by one of Jesus' closest disciples, telling all about Jesus, what he did and, and how he ministered to people. And this story that, that or this, this passage we're going to look at today is a passage of, of some, some teaching, some things that Jesus said to his followers in Jesus' last days, in his, his last days on earth. And if you knew that in less than a week you were going to be gone, wouldn't you, like, make sure you said all the important things that you need to say to all the important people in your life? That's, that's, what, that's what was happening for Jesus. He knew that his time, the mission that he came to earth for, was about to take place. And so he, he was just ramping up all, all of his messages. He was bringing what was most important to him. That's what he was talking about. But not only that, but the, the passage of Scripture right before what, I, what, what we're going to focus on today, Jesus says, the enemy is coming. He says, my hour is come. Satan is coming to try to trip me up and take me down. And he says to his, to his followers, so you better rise up. Like, let's, let's go. This is go time. So Jesus is setting this up for, to say, this is super important. What I'm about to tell you, my followers, this is super important, so pay attention. This is not just fluff. This is not just transition. This is vital to your relationship with God. And then there's one other thing that just gives me a, a, a hint that this is really important to Jesus. He spends a long time talking about this. It's not like just he says a phrase and just moves on to another topic. Like he lands on what we're about to land on. He lands on it for a significant portion of time. He is giving it the weight of the, the context, the weight of timing, and the weight of, of length. Like he is saying, wow, listen up. I hope I have your attention, people, because this is super important. And it's really very good news. I love it. Today... Don't we love a good return on investment? Like, don't we like to see our efforts rewarded? Yes. Don't we like to see success in what we put our hand to? Like, if you start a business, you want that business to thrive. Amen? I'm feeling like some Philly cheesesteak sandwiches. Am I right here? That's right. At the Layover Grill in Des Moines. New business started by some people in our church. It is an awesome place. You got to go. But you, when you, put, you buy something, you invest your time, your lay, your, your work in it, you want it to succeed. You, you want it to make a difference. If you write a book, if you record a song, if you, like, uh, a live stream a podcast, you, you, you put some effort into it. You want it to be successful. You want it to do something. You want a return on that investment. When you raise your kids, if you're a parent, 
when you raise your kids. It is a ton of effort, am I right? We were just talking to our niece this past weekend, and she, she has a, a, a one-year-old, we're celebrating the one-year-old birthday, and, and, and she was saying, well, I'm starting to almost get a whole night's sleep now. Like that, a year, a year of never a full night's sleep, like that is an investment. You want to see something come of that as a parent. Like that, that's a big deal. If you're in a relationship, you have a friendship, you have a spouse, you have kids or family members or coworkers. Like if there's people that you have a relationship with, when you put effort into that, you want to see something come out of it, don't you? I mean, it's, it matters to you. Like, if you're going to put in the effort, we, you want to see it succeed at some level. You want to see a flourishing of that business, that book, that podcast, that relationship, those kids. You want to see a relationship improve. Like, if you put all that effort into your kids, you at least want them to love you. You know, like, that would be amazing. You, because, I mean, you've, you've given your love, you've given your work, your effort. You want to be loved in return. It's natural to want something in return for the investment, for the fruit. You expect to get out of it at least what you put into it, right? And don't we sometimes kind of on the, the, the converse, is that the converse? Don't we sometimes say, well, meh, I didn't put that much into it. I'm not expecting that much out of it. Like it kind of goes that way. It's, it's, it's just a, a principle God's put in the universe. You want to see fruit. You want to see fruit. And if you're a follower of Jesus, it's reasonable, it makes sense that Jesus would want to see fruit in your life. He, he, he wants to see the fruit of relationship. He wants to see different kinds of fruit in your life. But what kind of fruit is he looking for? We're going to take a look at that today. Is there more than one type of fruitfulness? Or is there just like when he said uh, be fruitful, is there just one type? Or is there different ways to be fruitful for the Lord? And a really, really important question, how can you make yourself more fruitful? How can you make yourself more fruitful? We're going to look at that today. Would you look with me in John chapter 15, verse 1? Start right at the beginning. And I'm going to take these verses a little bit uh, out of order because I want to group, I want to set up what Jesus is, is uh, portraying for us. Jesus brings an illustration, all right? Verse 1, verse 5, verse 2. I am the true grapevine, Jesus said, and my father is the gardener. There, uh, there are, uh, uh, there's a, a translation of the Bible called the Amplified. And because it is, it is so um, nuanced and so tricky to translate from one language into another, the Bible was not originally written in English. It was written in other languages. That's, that's a challenge. So the Amplified Bible, they said, hey, we want to just make sure we alert you to the different nuances. So the Amplified says, uh, it would be like saying, um, uh, that's a big house. Casa Grande. Well, how are you going to translate that? Well, you could say, it's, it's, a, it's a big house. It's a house with a lot of square footage. It's a, it's a house with a lot of rooms. See what I just did? I Amplified I, I took those meanings. I, I didn't add my own meaning. I just like add, like that's what that word, those words mean. And that's what the Amplified does. So I'm going to re actually refer to that, that translation a little bit more than I do today. And I, I just love it so much. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. The Amplified uses the word the vine dresser. And I really love that picture. It's a very picturesque word. It's another way of saying gardener. But it's not just someone who goes out and weeds every couple of months. And hopes for some carrots. That, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, my father is the vine dresser. Jesus said, I'm the grapevine. My father is the gardener, the vine dresser. Yes, I am the vine. In verse 5, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. So Jesus has identified three people or groups of people. Jesus is the true grapevine. Our heavenly father, his father, our father, is the gardener, the vine dresser. And we, as followers of Jesus, are the branches. This is a very picturesque way to look at our relationship with God. It's, and it's how Jesus sees our relationship with him. Now, a, a vine dresser works very hard. 
Uh, I'm not really a uh, like a vineyard specialist, so I just did some research. I, I, I research. I, I, I watched some videos of, of them out in the field. What do they do? And my eyes were really opened to how hard they work. And the vine dresser, man, he goes at it. There's some things that a machine can help with, but there is quite a bit of stuff that is still only done by hand, even in those huge vineyards that are thousands of acres. There, there is something that has to be done. There is, a, there is a dressing of those vines. I'm going to talk about that a little bit as we go along. Why would they do all that work? They have a goal in mind. They want a harvest. They want fruit, healthy, abundant, plentiful fruit. And I can tell you from this passage, and as we go along, I think you'll see, our Heavenly Father loves fruitfulness. The Father loves fruitfulness. He really cares about it. He really wants it. He really prizes it and values it. In fact... The first recorded command in the Bible to Adam and Eve way back was, be fruitful. So like the first thing in in the father's mind was fruitfulness. As he made those people and as he got them started on the planet, he wants fruitfulness. That is super duper important to God. Okay, verse 2 The father, he, the father, cuts off every branch of mine, Jesus said, that doesn't bear, that doesn't produce fruit. Now remember, you and I are the branches. The father, he, cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. There's a whole lot of cutting going on. Have you noticed that in this? And the father looks for fruit in your life. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I've told this story before, but probably one of the maddest my wife has ever been to, uh, to me was we, we, had, we were renting this place, and uh, we had this huge laurel hedge. It was like 10 feet tall, 6 feet thick. The kids played on it. It was always lush green year-round. It was like a really great whole back border of our, our property. And a guy from church was going to come over and help me prune. He's like, we got to prune that so we will do better in the future. Well, the last thing Pastor Shelley said before she left that day, I think she was going, you know, like going grocery shopping or off, doing something with the kids or something. It was just me and that guy from church together. Last thing she said, make sure you leave enough for our kids to play in. Well, my friend probably was right, but... <laughs> We took that thing down to stubs. It was like a couple sticks were left. And technically, the kids could climb on those sticks. So technically, I did obey. (laughs) Reminds me of Saul. I did obey. (laughs) Um, uh, Anyway, it was nothing left. We pruned so much. I do wonder now, 20 years later, I bet it's really lush again. Um, However... um, it, 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 in order to have healthy plants, in order to have the best vineyard, it does take some pruning. And it takes someone who knows what they're doing, unlike myself on that day. So the Father looks for fruit in your life. I love the way it says it in the Amplified. Just another translation of the same verse we just read. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, in other words, that stops bearing, he cuts away trims off, takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes. I just, that really caught my attention. He repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. The Father is into fruitfulness. Like, it is a big, big deal to God. And so Jesus takes us to the vineyard, man. He just shows us uh, a real-life illustration of our relationship with God. So the Father is the vine dresser. So he's not just a gardener, not just like an occasionally goes out to the vineyard. He is out there working those vines every day. Uh, He is working some part of the vineyard. And year-round, he is dressing it. Year-round. Like there are some short times waiting for the leaves to fall off. Uh, where there's not much activity, but then they're right back at it. 
the father as a vine dresser, we have this image of him that he is tending. He is inspecting your life. He is caring for what's diseased or broken. He is pruning away the stuff that is detracting from the health. And he is shaping those vines. He is purifying it. Now, I, uh, I've been around, like I, I used to live in eastern Washington. I was in places where there were lots of orchards and farms. But at that time, there were not very many vineyards. Now, a lot of those apple orchards are now vineyards over there. So I didn't really get to see this firsthand. And so what I pictured when I think of pruning, I think of uh, typically in an orchard, there is pruning season. Like in January, February, there's, there's one main season where they're really pruning it back. Uh, when the sap's not running, the leaves are down, they shape it up, they get ready for the, the coming spring. But not so with, with a vineyard, with, with grape vines. There is that season. Leaves, leaves are gone or early January, February. They're, they're pruning, and they, they, they do the, that initial shaping. They choose, like, uh, 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 my understanding is grapes are only going to grow on a new branch, kind of interesting so they prune all, most of the old away but they, they choose two good ones and two spares just in case the frost kills some of them they 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 choose new ones a couple of last year's vines that were growing vertically they choose two of those to be the canes that go horizontally along the, the wires in, in you know the, the vineyard and then they choose they choose actually the buds that are going to grow up and make new branches this year uh, so that's the that's the first pruning but then as the leaves get on, uh, they, they start um, uh, making sure that all the grapes are shaded, all the, the budding grapes, so, so that when they're just very younger and, uh, young and tender, that they're not hurt by the sun. But then at a certain point, once they're stronger, then they start clipping away the, the, uh, the leaves that are blocking too much sun so that the grapes can get enough sun. So that's like a third pruning. And, and then they, there's another time when the grapes are fuller and they're starting to get heavier. And they have this ratio. We need two, uh, two uh, I, think it's, I think it's down low, if I understood right, like two grapes on this branch down low, one, one bunch of grapes here, and no grapes up here for the best for the, for the grapevine. Like they're constantly pruning, shaping, making it just right, caring for those branches so that they bear the maximum fruit possible. That's a picture of the Father working on your life and on my life. Very interesting that branches don't prune branches. I thought that was kind of an interesting observation. The vine dresser has the tools. He prunes the branches. So it's not really so much our job <laughs> to do that. However, guess what some of the father's tools look like? You and me. I'm a tool. I'm a tool. You're a tool. You're a tool. You're a tool. We're tools in the father's hand, but he is doing the pruning in his way. Not so much pruning gets done, you know, it's just in the privacy of your own uh, room, in the privacy of your own house. A lot of pruning happens in the body of Christ, in the gathering, because that's where, that's where the rubber meets the road. I think he uses some sandpaper for pruning. So the father is the vine dresser. He's tending, caring, inspecting. Jesus is the vine. He is that thick uh, trunk, almost looks like a small tree trunk of a grapevine. He, he is the vine from which all the other branches come. So the life comes from him. Fruitfulness comes from the vine, comes from Jesus through us. All the nutrients flow through that vine to the branches and then to the fruit. It was interesting to me that uh, grapevines, they, they're kind of picky about where they grow. And so there are, there are grapes that are used to our soil in our country. And if they, say, want, want to have some European grapes, well, it's, it's better not to just plant those right in the ground. Because in the ground, there are food, or, uh, uh, soil-borne pests and things that hurt that vine. And so what they will do is once the vine is mature... Uh, the vine actually becomes a shield, and they will graft in, like if they want to graft in some European grapes, they will graft it into the vine, and the, and the vine protects those branches from the pests. Isn't that so cool? What a cool picture. So the, Jesus is the vine. You and I are the branches. It's, he's looking for fruit from us, but the life comes from him. The protection comes from him. He is our source of life. We don't have to drum up that life. 
We are the branches. So we are sharing, he is sharing his life and vitality with us. Here's something I want to refer back to what I, 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 I mentioned in the beginning. Branches cannot try harder to bear fruit. In the illustration, that's just not how it works. Grape, uh, grape branches, they don't like, you know, white knuckle, I'm just going to bear more fruit. That's, that's just not how it works. But what they have to do is they just have to stay connected. They have to stay connected to the vine. So connected to the vine, in the care of the vine dresser, submitting to his thinning, to his pruning. And that is where we produce fruit. And I think it's really cool that there's also sap going through there. And I, I think Jesus didn't mention it, but I, that's a great picture of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is flowing out, the life of Jesus flowing out from him. And how does Jesus live inside our lives and inside our hearts? By his Spirit. His spirit is the sap, delivering all that life. He is the life in us and in our relationship with God. All right, I'm going to go on to verse 4 here. John 15, verse 4. So, so Jesus said, remain in me. Somebody say that, remain in me. Remain. Now, you might have memorized this. For those of you who have been around uh, uh, the Bible for a long time in other translations, and, and different translators take that same word, just trying to convey the meaning in English. What was Jesus getting at? Uh, remain in me. Continue in me abide in me. That's one of my favorites. It's just such a, oh, such a sweet word. Abide, dwell, live in me. Jesus said, remain in me, abide in me, and I will remain in you, continue in you, dwell in you, live in you. What a great thing. So there's a command and a promise. Remain in me, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Praise the Lord, yes. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed, cut off, broken off from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. I love how the Amplified says it. Unless you remain vitally united to me. That's where the fruit is. The fruit is in your connection to the vine. You're a branch. I'm a, I'm a branch. You're, uh, Jesus is the vine. He said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Will, will, not maybe, I hope so, but will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's so, so such a great contrast. Connected to me, you, can have, you will bear much beautiful, amazing fruit. Apart from me, you can't do anything. You will not produce any fruit for God, any fruit for the kingdom of God. So if you are looking for 10 easy steps to be a fruitful follower of Jesus, you're not going to find it here. This is not a list of, of, of the 10, you know, like just do these, do these 10 things every day for 15 minutes and you will be fruitful. Uh, what can a physical branch do to make itself more fruitful? Nothing. Fruitfulness comes from connection. Fruitfulness comes from connection to Jesus. You're a branch, I'm a branch. Our fruitfulness is in our connection to Jesus. The vine dresser creates the best conditions. So he is working, the Father is working in your life. And he says, oh, I'm just going to take off a little bit of my protection here. They, they need this, tri this, this trial to, to, to prune them a little bit and to actually make them stronger in their faith and closer to me. He is like tending. He's, he's actually pulling away some of those shading leaves sometimes. And at other times, he's making sure that you're tied up just right under the shade. Oh, man, my child, just, they need to rest in this season. I'm going to do the best thing. for. That's what the Father's doing for you. He's creating the conditions conditions for you and I to have the most fruit possible. Yeah. Jesus commanded you to remain abide. He promised that he will remain abide in you. So I want to ask you, how's your continuing going? How's your remaining going? How's your abiding in Jesus going? How's your dwelling going? Are you, are you dwelling in Jesus? Are you living in Jesus? How is that going? And I hope the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you during this message about that. How is it going? If, if you and Jesus take care of your connection, you will bear much fruit. 
Speaking of fruit, I'm going to ask the ushers to help me right now, if you would, please. I've got some fruit for you. I just feel like it's just so appropriate on this message. Fruit is delicious. And you guys, why don't you come to the front? Would you let's start at the front, and we'll go front and, and move back. Awesome. Um, the uh, fruit is refreshing. I don't know if you've ever been thirsty before. There are some times when I'm thirsty, I will reach for grapes. Uh, there's just something about them. They're refreshing. They are, uh, they're, they're satisfying. If you're hungry, fruit is, uh, is satisfying. Oh, thank you. Fruit is satisfying. Uh, fruit is filling. Uh, I think grapes are an especially pleasant fruit. They just are happy. They come in many varieties. They taste so great. And they have another benefit that the grape growers of America have not yet started marketing. But I think once they get a hold of this message, they're going to. Stephen, my son, he knows what I'm about to say. If you're ever in a situation like you're out camping, you're driving and eating in the car on the way to a meeting, and you, don't, you can't brush your teeth, grapes are nature's toothbrush. I, I don't know what it is about them. But they just get in there, and they clean those Oreos right out of your teeth, uh, and they just make it all squeaky clean. Like, there's just so much good about grapes. I just love them so much, and I hope you enjoyed them. And if we have leftovers, uh, which I think we, we might, take, take some on your way out because, the, you know, they're, they need to be eaten up today. So it, it, enjoy those. So what kind of fruit is the Father looking from, for, from you in your life? Is, is he looking for you to sprout some grapes out your ears? Like, no, that's not, that's not what, he's not looking for grapes. But he is looking for fruit in your life. And I am guessing that the kind of fruit that he's looking for from you depends. I, I believe that it depends on the person. It depends on where you're at in your journey. If you uh, put your faith in Jesus today, which I hope you will, if you haven't already then that is the fruit of repentance, and he's super happy with that. That is plenty of fruit for today. That is awesome. Uh, if you've been serving the Lord for 50 years, uh, not, not quite 50 years for me. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. More, more than 50 years for me. Wow, it's, it suddenly got hot in here. <laughs> Turn up the fans. Um, wow, I've been serving the Lord for a long time, and so the Lord is probably looking for a different, different kinds of fruit in me. Then perhaps than in someone else. Wow, okay, Lord, yes, yes. Bear that fruit through me, Lord. So I thought of three different kinds of fruit. I, have, I think that the Bible would, would support other kinds of fruit, but I saw three that I think are sort of main kinds of fruit that, that come from your connection to Jesus. The first fruit is the fruit of being like Jesus. The fruit of being like Jesus. And in Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23, it describes this fruit. But the Holy Spirit, the sap in your branches, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Who's producing it? Oh, wait a minute. Was it supposed to say the branch produces this fruit? That's not what it says. The Holy Spirit produces this fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the sap, the Holy Spirit working through excuse me, through your life, he moves through the vine, he does the work in the branches, and he produces this fruit in you. So if you and Jesus just keep mutually abiding, living, remaining, continuing with each other, this fruit will grow in your life. I have been to places where, like, we're going to have a class on this. And I do think it would be great to have a class, like, teaching us about what does this fruit look like? How does the Holy Spirit produce it? But not so much a, a class to, to like, oh, squeeze harder to get more peace out of my life. Because in this case, the fruit we're talking about is produced by the Holy Spirit. You will be more like Jesus, more and more like him. That is a fruit that happens when you abide, when you stay connected. Another kind of fruit, this is not the only, but it's another kind of fruit, is the fruit of behaving like Jesus. Fruit of being like Jesus, fruit of behaving like Jesus. In Colossians 1, verses 9 to 10, starting partway through the verse, it says this, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then... 
The way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. So God does something in you and me. God supplies the knowledge of his will. God gives you spiritual wisdom and understanding. And the way that works out is in your behavior, in your actions, in your choices, in your thoughts. It it works itself out. God works himself out in you by when you abide in Jesus, when you stay connected to him. And then one other kind of fruit, and maybe this is the first one you thought of, I don't know. Another kind of fruit is baptizing new followers of Jesus. And it's a good day when they all start with the same letter, being, behaving, and baptizing. There's a fruit of your abiding with Jesus that is baptizing new followers of Jesus. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples, or Jesus apprentices, of all the nations, Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So at the, the tense, the, the implication of this verse is that as you're going about your life, like we, we sometimes want to take this verse and go, oh, that's for the 0.001% of the population that's a full-time missionary. That's not what Jesus is saying. This is a plural you, and he's saying as you all go, as you live your life, as you abide in me, As you live in me, and as I live in you, and as my words live in you, go make disciples. Go help people follow Jesus. Go introduce people to Jesus. So in other words, all the people you meet are opportunities for fruit, for you to to introduce them to Jesus. And, And even more than just introducing, you know, you could just put one hand of a friend into Jesus' hand and get them to shake hands, and then you can walk away. But even better, if you said, hey, I'm following Jesus, let's do this together. I'll show you how. Let, let's go pray together. Let, let's read the Bible together. That, that is making disciples. That is what Jesus has called all of us to do, and that is bearing fruit. And the Father, the vine dresser, has been lining up little opportunities for you He pruned off this appointment so that you would end up going here. The flat tire, mm, boy, that seems so bad. And yet you look back and go, oh, wow, that was a really cool time to have a half-hour ride with a tow truck driver from Bahrain, uh, which I had this. So cool. What an opportunity to just share the life of Jesus with somebody that you would never have before because the Father is dressing the vine. And and he's, he's creating opportunities for fruitfulness for you and for me. Have you ever noticed when we baptize people in water, and we've got a baptism coming up in in a few weeks, when we baptize people in water, we usually will ask them this question. Remember this question? Who helped you put your faith in Jesus? What are we doing? We're celebrating their fruitfulness. That is so cool. If you can help someone find Jesus, that is bearing fruit. So uh, being behaving, and baptizing. Those are three kinds of fruit, and I believe there are probably others. Down in the same chapter, John 15, verse 6 to 8, Jesus is kind of, he's going just a little deeper. He says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch, and it withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. You can't just let them sit there. They're going to attract rodents and pests. They burn them. That's, that's what you got to do. But Jesus said, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, my words live in you, my words abide in you, my words continue in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. And guess what happens? When you abide in Jesus, when you dwell in him, your wants change. And that's why Jesus would so boldly say in this context, we often take that verse out of context, which is unfortunate. Jesus said, in this context, you're abiding in me, I'm abiding in you. We're living in each other. Now ask me for what you want, and I will give it to you. Yes, that is awesome. The Father Father will give it to you. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. The Father loves fruitfulness. And I would say it this way. The Father disdains disconnection, and he rewards remaining in Jesus. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. The the command is to remain. 
He never commands us in this whole passage, go bear fruit. He says, remain and you will bear fruit. So we're just going to take all those burdens right off of all those rules, all those things right off your shoulders and just say, just focus on one thing. Live in Jesus. Just live in Jesus. Just live in Jesus. Let his words live in you. Open up your, yourself to him to let him live in you. I love it. So this is a message about fruitfulness. Is the action step go try harder? No, nope, that's not what Jesus said. Is it go practice being loving, joy, joyful, peace-filled, kind, good? Nope. Is it go try to obey more Bible commands and so you'll be more fruitful? Nope. Is it go be a more active witness so you'll be more fruitful? Nope. It's a message about abiding. And when you abide, you will do all those things. But you don't do all those things to get his presence. You press into his presence. He is like, he's waiting. He wants to be your all in all. And then he wraps it up in verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain, continue, abide, dwell, live in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. It's a cause and effect thing here. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Did Jesus obey the Father's commands in order to try so hard to get the Father to love him? No. It's because the Father loved him, Jesus obeyed the Father. And when he obeyed the Father, that kept him abiding. It's such a cool picture for us. And Jesus says, I'm giving you the example. Do what I did. He said, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow to others. I added to others. Your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. So this whole passage is about love. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you're abiding in Jesus, and you will produce fruit. But none of us can even abide perfectly on our own. None of us can just stay dwelling in Jesus 24-7, just unbroken communion, everything just going great, everything smooth. We're just, we're not like that. We're broken. And so what we do is we rely on Jesus' finished work. He did it all. He made the way for relationship. He paid the sacrifice, the, the penalty for our sins. He sacrificed his life. He did it all. So we rely on Jesus even to help us abide, even to help us dwell. We rely on him. And we look at his example. He remained in his father, he said. He remained in his father's love, he said. He obeyed his father's commands, he said. We look at that example. We rely on him. He, he did do it perfectly. We rely on his perfection. Because fruitfulness comes from connection. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to pray. If you're, if you're watching online, would you make wherever you are a place of prayer? And let's, let's talk to the Lord right now. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord, we so want to, as, as followers of Jesus, we want to remain in you. We want to continue in you. We want to abide in you. We want, we want to, it, our, our relationship with you to be so tangible. It's as tangible as saying, I'm in my house. Like we know when we've gone through the door and we're in our house, we know. Our feet feel it. We can sense it. It smells like, a, like home. Like we know when we're at our house. Lord, we want to know you're our dwelling place. We want to know. We want to feel it. We want to sense it that we are with you. And Jesus, you've already told us your will. Your will is to remain in us. So we're not begging you to remain in us. We're just trying not to push you away. We're trying not to step away from you. Lord, help us to dwell. Help us to abide. Help us to live in you. Lord, may we say to live is Christ, 
may we say that. May, may that be true of our lives, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to set aside striving. Help us to set aside seeking for your approval. Let, let, let that not be our focus, Lord. But instead, let us rest in you. Jesus, let us abide in you. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. It's great to abide in you. We find our rest in you. And Lord, I just pray that today and tomorrow and the next day, we would be people of your presence, that we would be people who abide in you, that we'd be people who live in you. Lord, may your words live in us. May we quote your words, the Bible. May we, may, may we pray your words. May we offer your words as encouragement to people around us. Lord, may your words abide in us, live in us. And Lord, I pray that when we're around others, that you would help us to see that as we love them, we're loving you. As we love them, we're loving you. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to be loving. Lord, we cannot do it on our own. We rely on your love, your grace, your mercy flowing through us. Holy Spirit life, come and flow through us that our joy would overflow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I just encourage you to talk to the Lord, to invite him in. I, I encourage you to assess your abiding. Assess your dwelling. Are you dwelling in Jesus? And let's just take steps to abide, to rest, to fall into Jesus. With your head still bowed, one more thing. I just want to give you an invitation to put your faith in Jesus. You know, I, I don't know where everyone is, you know, individually. I, I can't see your heart, and it's not really my place to. But I do want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. H how do you do that? You turn from your sins because our sins separate us from Jesus. You turn the opposite way. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. That's how you start. That's, that's the first fruit that God would love to see in your life. It's just a fruit of coming and giving your life to Jesus. I invite you to put your faith in Jesus, trusting him to save you and not your own efforts. Our own efforts are always going to fall short. If today's your day, if now is your moment to put your faith in Jesus, to become a Christian, to become a follower of Jesus, maybe you're coming back to Jesus. Maybe you're giving your life to him for the first time ever. If today's your day, would you just raise your hand so I would know? And that's just going to be a signal to me to pray for you specifically. Would, would you just raise your hand to say, yes, pastor, I am putting my faith in Jesus right now. I want to become a Christian. And that's so cool. People here in the room, but also online as well. I invite you online. Uh, several people here in the room. That is awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, you're doing something right now. I can tell. Father, you, you've just created some conditions today for us to bear fruit a fruit of just relationship with you. Thank you, Lord. And for, on, for, for you online, I encourage you even to do something physical. Raise your hand to God. He can see you and say, I'm, I'm giving you my life, Jesus. I'm giving you my life, Jesus. I'd love to just coach you in a prayer. I just want to make sure that you know how to pray to give your life to Jesus. And uh, church, let's just support those who are putting their faith in Jesus today. Let's just all pray out loud. But if you raise your hand, if this is your day, would you pray this right to Jesus? Pray it right to him right now. Let's go out loud. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we just want to welcome you to the kingdom of God. If you just prayed that prayer today, listen, that means something. And a transformation is beginning on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit is working in your life right now. You may or may not feel him. If you do, awesome. If you don't, it doesn't matter because we put our faith in Jesus. We trusted in Jesus. When you invite Jesus in, he always says yes because it's not based on your performance. He has come into your life right now. He is new sap growing up through you, and new life is coming into your heart and into your spirit right now. That is amazing. 
and that is awesome. Listen, you got to let someone know. Let someone know that that is, a, uh, that is a mature Christian. So a great way to do it is with the Connect card. Uh, there's a Connect card online. There's a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. Just give me your name and an email or, uh, and or cell phone, and I'll, I will get to you this week. And just let, check the box at the bottom that says, I put my faith in Jesus. We care about that. And, and the Father is going to use us to help tend that vine so you bear fruit for Jesus. The fruit of being, behaving, and, and even baptizing. Wow, that's awesome. That's what's beginning for you right now. Let us know, right? Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Pastor Garrett. Let's all abide in Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, at this time, the ushers are going to be coming down the aisle to pick up all those Connect cards. If you're filling one out right now, do it real quick. Um, and then also remember, next week, we are having our all-church barbecue. Some, yeah, come, yeah, come, come here first. Amen. We're having church first. So if you go to the park and there's no one yes. there. That's why. Um, come to church first, and after church, we're going to head to Veterans Memorial Park for that barbecue. Everyone's invited. You don't have to bring anything. We have, ev yeah, we have everything, everything you for you. We'll see you next week. Amen. God bless. How's it going? I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here today. It's good to see you. That's okay. Maybe I'm feeling a little sleepy, maybe. Yeah, I understand. That's all right. God bless you guys. Glad you're here. Hey, would you mind turning on the lights? Guys, oops, that's awesome. <laughs> um, a few. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow, that's amazing. I yeah.